Good morning and welcome to Christ Temple Los Angeles. We're located at 3125 West 54th Street and we're glad you're here. We hope our ministry and message encourage you to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. To our Christ Temple members, let's remember to give our tithes and offering and you can do that one of several ways. One, through PayPal. Another way is ChristTempleLA.org or you can drop off here at Christ Temple. And finally, you can give through the mobile app Venmo where our username is at Christ Temple LA. Please join us this morning for Sunday School. Tell a friend, Sunday School starts at 9.30 a.m. And remember our Bible study is on Wednesday, the prayer call, and it begins at 6.30 p.m. This evening, this evening, this evening, the National UCWM prayer call begins at 6 p.m. and our very own Sister Erica Lindsay McCool will be the speaker. This morning, our speaker will be our pastor, Bishop Lindsay. So grab your Bible, a notebook, and buckle up. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this opportunity that we have to come before your presence. We thank you for your love and for your kindness and for uh, all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for watching over us and for taking care of us and for keeping us in this season. Well, Lord, we pray that as uh, our pastor opens up your word, that we open up our hearts and we pray that you would pour into us, that we may pour out to others, Lord. We pray that you would search our hearts and our minds and our souls, Lord, and speak to us where we are. Encourage us through your word. We pray that you would encourage us, strengthen us, and bless us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to have you join us this uh, lovely Lord's Day morning in the worship of our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. We come today to give you a word from the living God. I'd like to read this morning from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. The word of God says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Seeing the crowds, seeing the crowds. If we have seen anything in the last two weeks, we have seen crowds and more crowds. Our streets have been filled with multitudes of people. People marching, people protesting, people crying out for justice. It's really been a beautiful sight to see black and brown and white come together, marching together, thousands upon thousands taking a stand for justice, equality, equity, fairness, standing together, united, oneness, communicating very powerfully the message, black lives do matter. This has been the message of the crowds, of the multitudes that have come together. The message that begs for justice. Not everyone though has seen these crowds who've been marching together peacefully, quietly, chanting, taking a stand in our streets, not everyone has viewed them the same way. The president, when he looks at them, he sees a problem. He sees a group that needs to be dominated. Politicians, when they look at them, they see voters that need to be satisfied. The police looks at the crowd and sees trouble. Looters have looked at the crowd and seen an opportunity. News people have looked at the crowds and they have seen a story that needs to be told. Probably everyone who's looked at the crowd has a slightly different perspective. How should the church see these multitudes that are marching in our street? These crowds that continue to fill the thoroughfares of our nations. Perhaps the better question is, has the church really seen them at all? Better yet, do we see the crowds with the eyes of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I want to take a look, and I invite you to join me this morning to take a look at Jesus and the crowds that he encountered in his day. One thing that's hard to get the church to do is to leave the building and to venture forth into the world, to go beyond its four walls. The church is intended to be a hospital for those who are sin sick, for those who are lost, for those who are in need of salvation. But too often we want to turn the church into a hotel to make it a very comfortable place for the saints of God. But our Lord said these words, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. And we live in a world with many people who are spiritually sin sick. Getting the church to go into the world has been a difficult challenge. COVID-19 has made us leave our buildings, but we can still leave our buildings and then go and hide in our homes. Matthew chapter nine reveals our Lord. Our Lord as a traveling teacher who was going throughout all the towns and villages of Galilee. He went about teaching, preaching, and healing. He went about sharing the good news of God's kingdom. 
And we as a church, we really do have good news. The message of our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection is good news for the world. The good news of how to have peace with God, our sins forgiven, and the assurance of eternal life. It's truly good news for a world that's lost and hurting in their sin. The Bible says that our Lord Jesus Christ went about preaching and teaching that good news of the kingdom. He also went about healing all those who were afflicted with any kind of illness or disease. The multitudes, they came from everywhere, crowds of people to hear him, to receive his ministry. They were on the move and on the march seeking the Savior. Sometimes the disciples didn't want to be bothered. Sometimes they were weary, they were tired, they were exhausted, they were stressed out. But the Bible says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he did not feel toward the multitudes as others did. He was not annoyed by the multitudes. He may have become tired in his body, but when he saw the multitude, first of all, we need to underline the fact, the reality is that he saw them. We need to park there for a moment because so often we don't see the crowd. So often we don't even see the multitude. We simply go on our merry way, preoccupied with our very mundane lives, living our life, serving our family, being with our friends, we know how to make it all about us. We can become so focused on our stuff and our life. We don't have any time left or energy for others. We really don't see them at all. We're pretty much into me and my and mine. When the Pharisees saw the multitudes, they saw a crowd that they wrote off. They considered the people, the people as people of the land people who were nobodies, unclean, insignificant. Why bother? But the Bible says that when Jesus saw them, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And because they were sheep without a shepherd, he was moved with compassion. He could feel, he could sense the pain, the emptiness, the misery of the lives that they were living. He saw their lost condition. He knew that they were tired, that they were lost, and they were hurting. They were living lives without purpose. They had no hope. They were lost without a relationship with the true and living God. Oh, we sometimes are so blind. We fail to see the multitude. We fail to, fail to see them living lives of quiet desperation men and women who are being taken advantage of by our great adversary, Satan, because his agenda remains the same. He comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. These multitudes were being destroyed. These multitudes were not living the kind of life that God intended. They were weary and faint and tired. Perhaps some of them had the experience of the musician Drake he said at some point that he had to have a different woman every night. But after the sex was over, he knew it wasn't working. And yet the very next day, he was out there doing it all over again. You think maybe you find it sometimes by being the very best in your world. But look at the documentary concerning Michael Jordan's life, the greatest basketball player of all times. But what does the documentary reveal? That even having it all did not lead to real, true happiness. Instead, it underscored the emptiness and the unsettledness of his life because we're never going to find that peace that the heart longs for in the fame and fortune that this world offers. Jesus saw the misery of the multitude, sheep, without a shepherd, without a guide, without direction for their lives, pitiful, helpless, not knowing where to go or how to get there. You know, that a shepherd will tell you that when it comes to sheep, if they accidentally stumble and roll over on their back, step into 
a depression in the ground and end up on their back. They just lie there and kick their feet in the air because there's no one to assist them to get to their feet and continue on their journey. If only they had a shepherd, someone to guide them, someone to go before them, someone to love them, someone to care for them. Oh, not only do sheep need a shepherd, but we as people, we need a shepherd. A lost person is not only lost without God, he or she is hopelessly lost. Someone described a lost person's life as a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat who is not there. Can you imagine anything more hopeless? And yet Jesus sees that hopelessness. He feels our pain. He feels our lostness. He knows that we have no direction for life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is moved at a very gut level. He's moved with compassion. He cares. And so often care and compassion are the missing jewels of the modern church. The church is so busy doing these many things and sometimes they are very good things, but those good things can be the enemy of the best thing. Going after lost people, finding them and bringing them to a personal relationship with the God of heaven and earth. And the Bible makes this observation Jesus seeing the multitudes, being, with, being moved with compassion. He is so concerned about people who are lost. The harvest, he says, is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We live in a world where there are almost 8 billion people on planet Earth. In America itself, over a nation of over 300 million people, uh, 160 million of those people have never, ever been born again. And so Jesus doesn't ask us necessarily just to pray for the lost, but Jesus says, pray for the laborers. Don't pray for the harvest, but pray for the harvesters. Don't pray for the sheep, but pray for the shepherd. Jesus would remind us today that there is a great harvest and the size of the harvest is not the problem, but the lack of the harvesters is the problem. And this is a problem that we need to come to grips with in our church. We talk about the lost world, and we have been commissioned to go into that lost world. A little boy was once asked by his dad to go somewhere, but the little boy responded to his dad, I ain't going. And the dad said to him, son, that's not proper English. Now listen very carefully. First person singular is, I am not going. Second person singular is, you are not going. Third person singular is, he is not going. And then the father continued, and the plural is, we are not going, or you are not going. Or the third person plural would be, they are not going. Now, son, do you understand that? And the son said, yes, sir, I understand. It seems that ain't nobody going nowhere. And so often this is our problem in the church. No one is going. Even though we have been given the great commission, even though we serve a Lord who sees the multitude, who sees the crowds of men and women who feel our land, who feel our streets, who feel our cities, and even though his heart was moved with compassion, those who say that they are called by Christ ain't going. When you pray to the Lord of the harvest, and that's what Jesus is. He's the Lord of the harvest. Don't be surprised that as you pray, that he taps you on the shoulder and says, you are somebody and you must go. Yes, he sends every Christian into the field. He wants all of us to go. 
because the harvest fields are calling. They are white already under harvest. The laborers are few. We need to see the multitudes. We need to feel their misery. We need to understand that the Lord is calling all of us to put our shoulders to the wheel and become ministers in this weary and tired world in which we live. Jesus is truly in the soul business. And if your salvation doesn't send you to others, you need to check your salvation, my friend. We need to ask our Lord Jesus Christ this morning, Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see as you saw the multitudes. Help me to feel what you feel concerning lost men, women, boys, and girls. Help me to realize, as you did, that people who are far from you, they are sheep without a shepherd, destined to be lost not only in this world, but lost for all eternity. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I now send you. As the Father sent his son Jesus into the world to be the savior of the world, to bear witness of the good news of the gospel, the Son now sends us who would say that he is our Lord, that we are his followers. We need to take up that mantle and hear the hymn writer as he writes, my father's work is pressing me and I must do it faithfully. The reapers on the field are few and to my Jesus, I must be true. And therefore, you and I need to go. You and I need to see the multitudes. We have been pushed out of the church building. Praise be to God. But as the marchers have gone into the streets, into the highways and the byways of this land with the message of justice, let us go into our streets and tell the world the good news of salvation. Let's tell our world that black lives and white lives and brown lives, they all matter to our God, the God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, Christ died for all because all men need a Savior. And whosoever will that will come to him will find in him the way that leads to life everlasting. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father and our God, we thank you for the good news. We thank you that you were a Savior who saw us in our lost condition and you felt our pain. You saw our helplessness and our hopelessness and you were willing to go to Calvary's cross, to die the death that we deserve so that we might have life. And Lord, we pray that you would raise up your church, that you would speak to our hearts, men and women, boys and girls, and may we be willing to go into the world around us. May we see as you saw the crowds in your day, and may our heart be moved with compassion. May we care, Lord. Give us a caring heart so that we would be compelled to share this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, amen. If you don't know Christ, we invite you to come to him today. If you are a follower of Christ, I invite you to open your eyes Look into your family. Look into your neighborhood. Look around on your job and see those men and women, boys and girls that you are with. See them as sheep without a shepherd. They're lost and they need your witness. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus. 
because if he's lifted up, he promised to draw all near unto himself. Amen. Just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. I shall. Two.